Hello and welcome to I Know Dino. I'm Garrett. And I'm Sabrina. And today in our 367th episode, we have a bunch of news, including two of the last four sessions of SVP. There was so much. Yeah. We're almost done. I don't think we're ever going to cover this much SVP again, because I think this is the last virtual year, hopefully. <laughs> That's true. It was easier to cover more talks since it was virtual. I, yeah, I can't remember ever getting this late into December still talking about SVP, but there's so much amazing stuff. It's basically like an entire year's worth of news in one week. So it's still very pared down, but there's a lot. So this week, we're going to talk about the Dinosaur Systematics, Diversity, and Biology session, as well as the Colbert Prize session which is a poster competition that they have at SVP. So I think they're pre-selected for the Colbert Prize. Like, we think these posters will be impactful. We're going to pick the best one and give them a prize. So Sabrina's got those. The dinosaur-related ones, anyway. Yes. Some of the other ones will probably pop up in that premium content. Oh, definitely. Which (laughs) will be available soon, we promise. (laughs) Yeah, we're still trying to get through all this dinosaur stuff before we get to the non-dinosaur stuff. And of course, we also have a dinosaur of the day, and this week it's Ankysaurus. But before we get into all of that, as always, we like to thank some of our patrons. No new patrons to thank this week, but we still have many other patrons that we like to thank. So this week, our 10 random drawing winners are Randy in Squim, Scotty, Joaquin, Tarkia Tamer, and Tarkia Tamer. It's a good week for Tarkia Tamer because we have a news item about Tarkia, the dinosaur. And rounding out the shout outs, Trev, Dennis Saltasaurus, Laurasaurus, Bradley, L. Rex, and Ranger Chris from Dino for Hire. Thank you so much to all of our patrons. Again, we really appreciate your support and obviously could not keep this podcast going for as long as we have without you. So jumping into the news, specifically our Dinosaur Systematics Diversity and Biology session from SVP, we're going to kick it off with a brand new ankylosaurid genus. Yes, the one that was previously Tarkia. Yeah, so now you know why I said we're going to be talking about Tarkia. <laughs> <laughs> Although I guess we're not really because it's not Tarkia anymore. Now it is a new ankylosaurid. Although it doesn't have a name yet, it's still known as MPC hyphen D 100 slash 1353. I'm sure that'll change soon. Yes, I think so. It was presented at SVP by Jin Young Park, and it's about a individual that was found in the Namekt formation. Yeah, they had a really well-preserved skull. Yep, and it was found in Mongolia. But it wasn't only a, a skull. It did have a really good skull. But it also had a lot of the body, including most of the hips, ribs, and a tail club. <laughs> I know how much you like the tail clubs. I really do. And we d- we often don't find them, especially in association with a skull. But that's what defines an ankylosaurid as an ankylosaurid and not a notosaur, is having that tail club on it, making it a real ankylosaur, some might say. <laughs> because what's an ankylosaur without a tail club, really? Well, nothing, obviously. No, yeah. Except for, I mean, there there's Borealopelta, and there are some that are pretty cool that don't have a tail club. But I digress. So (laughs) this individual is found in 2008. It was returned to Mongolia in 2016. And like you said, the skull is in really great shape, including lots of teeth. Because it is a ankylosaur, usually they're basically defined based on their skull. Mm -hmm. So that makes it easier having a well-preserved skull. Yeah, it's basically the only way that you can really define a new genus. They do on occasion name them when it's a really good rest of the body, but it's always sort of with an asterisk because we don't really have anything to compare it to because a lot of times it's just a skull and that's where a lot of the unique features are. So based on the skull, they found 17 new characters which appear to support it being a new genus. That's a lot of characters. Sometimes it's only based on like a handful. Yeah, it can be as low as one or two. I think five to six is a pretty common number of characters that they find. 17, yeah, it's, it's a lot. All of those are in the skull, which is perfect because that's where we usually define things. Most of them are really, really specific. Like this dimension of this bone is slightly more than whatever, like 1.15 to 1 from this other bone and all sorts of minutia like that. The only two that I thought were pretty neat looking superficially are that it has a, quote, bulbous 
skewed <laughs> at the tip of its snout that sort of gives it an appearance of like a little bit of a nose, sort of a little bulbous nose, hmm. like the tip of the snout. And it also has a horn on the back bottom of the skull, so sort of pointing down towards its shoulders that has a quote unquote neck. So it's a little bit thinner and it has an interesting appearance to it. Mm hmm. But they also found some pathologies that they think could be from active combat. Yeah, so there were healed fractures in the ribs, basically around the pelvis and at like the wider part of the body. And that supports Victoria Arbor's previous theory that these ankylosaurs were mostly using their tail clubs to bash into each other. Mm -hmm. They would kind of back up. <laughs> I imagine like trucks backing up really awkwardly <laughs> with like a trailer because they're so big and lumbering. But it probably wasn't quite that awkward. And then like, hitting each other with their tails and i guess they end up lining up where they're half overlapped so one's tail is at the other one's hips and that's where they're hitting each, hitting each other that must be really painful yeah it it would be but it might not be super terrible because when victoria arbor first promoted this idea she pointed out that a lot of ankylosaurs have extra big spiky osteoderms on their sides mm -hmm. that stick out near their hips and then some of them are broken so they're kind of protected it's not hitting them in like the soft fleshy oh, true. bits it's a little bit protected i don't know how many nerve endings they have in osteoderms i assume they're not super sensitive i was thinking also the tail themselves bashing into these osteoderms i can't feel good either yes that that's a really good point because in addition to the ribs around the pelvis being fractured they also found that there was an injury to one of the ossified tendons in the tail club and that the left osteoderm in the club itself is smaller than expected compared to other ankylosaurs and also compared to the right half of the tail club because we have the whole thing. And what they pointed out is they had an analogy to rams. So rams that ram each other. That's probably where the name comes from, I guess. <laughs> the big horns. Mm -hmm. When they're bashing their faces together, <laughs> they're the tops of their heads together, hitting their horns, it stunts the growth of their horns after they hit them together. And that might be what's happening with this ankylosaur tail club. Maybe it's smashing that left side more than the right side. It's like preferring one side over the other. And that side is getting stunted in growth from all the smashing into the osteoderm. So even if it's not hurting, it's definitely injuring it right. so that it's not growing There's as well. There's an effect. A tangible effect. Yeah. Another piece of evidence they had, which I thought was really interesting, is they said that elephants have tusk asymmetry because they prefer one side. So there's like a handedness, like how most humans are right-handed. Elephants also have a preferred tusk that they use for manipulating stuff. And whichever one they're rubbing on things more often or using more it tends to be a little bit smaller because it gets hmm. stunted by all that use. So not quite the same as our hands because our hands are roughly the same size. Yeah, I suppose so. <laughs> they don't. We don't use them as vigorously <laughs> to stunt their growth yeah. as like, rams or ankylosaurs. That's true. A couple other interesting things about this new genus is that the shape of its beak appears to be at a browsing height rather than a grazing height. So it, it, therefore, it's like a little bit higher off the ground. I'm pretty sure that's browsing versus grazing. And grazing is like a cow, right? I think so. So I guess the idea there is that you need that more flat front to the mouth if you're going to be down <laughs> in the ground trying to shear, shear off these this low vegetation. And they found a correlation with other modern animals. This was a previous study building on that. And as a, a final aside, the reason it might have been a browser and not a grazer is because ornithopods showed up in the late Cretaceous around when this ankylosaurid was roaming around and those ornithopods were probably grazers so it being a browser mm -hmm. was probably an advantage for some niche partitioning there mm -hmm. and just some other dinosaurs that this ankylosaur coexisted with included hadrosaurids therizinosaurs and sauropods so we've got like therizinosaurus dinochirus barsboldia nemectosaurus to name a few yeah that's a that's an awesome time period to go to mm -hmm. Just, I think, after Hell Creek, it might even be more interesting when you've got the sauropods along with their xenosaurs yeah, and ankylosaurids. Make everything more interesting. They do. But <laughs> I also think ankylosaurids make things more interesting. Sure, sure, sure. <laughs> but really, 
I mean, in an unbiased way, Therizinosaurs are one of the most interesting animals ever in history. True. <laughs> so it's quite a ecosystem there. It's mostly yeah, having this diversity of animals in one yeah. spot. Yeah. Yeah, the Namekt formation is amazing. Next up, we've got a talk by John Foster, and it's basically an update on the sauropod discovery we talked about with Brian Eng. And Matt Wadle. This is back in episode 271, our interview with them, if you want to check it out. Yeah, if you haven't listened to this interview, I highly recommend it because the the way they got this fossil out was crazy. Mm -hmm. It involves like horses pulling a sled and all sorts of just crazy town <laughs> getting this huge sauropod bone out of the ground. But it's now been fully or at least prepared enough that they can get all the measurements off of it. And they also found some more bones and shared about those from this too. So specifically, this bone is from the salt wash member of the Morrison Formation. The Morrison Formation, the one where you get Apatosaurus and Camarasaurus and Brachiosaurus, all of everybody's favorite North American sauropods. Yep. <laughs> and so this part is in southern Utah. Yep. Although I think the saltwash member is spread out a little bit more than that. Actually, I think it's quite spread out. Yep. In general, the Morrison Formation is all over the place. But for this particular sauropod, it was in southern Utah they found. Yes. So they found it in 2014, and it started out as a sauropod vertebra. So then they expanded their search to see if they could find some other stuff. And apparently they found a lot of fossilized wood, but they also found about 24 individuals, <laughs> which is crazy. It's so many. They think it included Brachiosaurus, Allosaurus, and Apatosaurus. And they said they looked like natural CT scans since they were crushed or basically sliced during fossilization. So even though there's 24 individuals, it's not like these are 24 complete skeletons. It's just like enough bones that they think it was from 24 different dinosaurs. In 2019, they found a large sauropod limb bone, which was just over two meters or well over six feet long. That's the one that Brian Eng told us about back in episode... 271. Thank you. The bone ended up being a humerus from a brachiosaurus, which explains why it's so huge, because... Of course, Brachiosaurus has very long front legs, which is how it gets that giraffe-like posture. And most of that height comes from the humerus, the upper arm bone. Yep. Or front leg bone, in the case of Brachiosaurus. So they had to use Clydesdale horses, not just any horses. <laughs> they move it, yeah. <laughs> yeah, to pull them out. And they said the horses weighed 1,800 pounds or 820 kilograms. So it was, quote, quite light for them, this fossil. Yeah, because it. I think it weighed pretty well over half a ton when they started but then they sort of skinned they reduced the jacket down a little bit yeah, to get it out and then they, it was down to like a thousand pounds they said a thousand twenty pounds or 464 kilograms in the jacket which i can't imagine pulling but i'm not a clydesdale that's true and with that humerus being about two meters long they think that the overall height of the brachiosaurus was around 10 meters tall which is well, like 34 feet, something like that. Very tall and about 30 to 40 tons. <laughs> so sauropods are so big. They, they really are. They also found a dorsal rib in July of 2021, which was 1.94 meters long, almost as long as the humerus. And they're at the Utah Field House in Vernal, right by Dinosaur National Monument, in case you're interested in Knowing where these are, I don't think they're on display. That bone we've been talking about is the right humerus, but they also found a left humerus, which is the first time ever for a brachiosaurus to find both the right and left. Unfortunately, though, the left humerus has eroded out and is was in a bunch of pieces, so it, was, it wasn't really embedded in rock by the time they found it. And we, we always talk about how ideally you actually want it to be buried. It sounds counterintuitive because mm -hmm. it's like you have to dig it out. But when it's in the rock, especially if you're in a place where it snows and gets icy, that protects the fossil. And this one had already been broken out of the rock by weathering over time, and then the fossil itself got weathered. It's a catch-22 because... You want it to be a little bit out of the rock so you know it's there. Yeah. yeah, but not completely out of the rock so that it gets 
destroyed. What's the thing people often say? Like, you find a toe bone and then it turns out it's attached to an entire specimen. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> the tip of the toe, so that the toe is a little bit eroded, but the rest of the skeleton is perfectly preserved inside. <laughs> is the ideal. But that not the case this time. So they did get that really good right humerus that was pretty well buried and preserved, but the left humerus eroded out and was pretty damaged. But they did also find shoulder bones, which is nice. So it wasn't just the humerus to work with. Mm -hmm. And the right humerus in total ended up being 201 (laughs) centimeters long. So just barely over two meters and 23 centimeters across in the middle. So pretty wide Mm -hmm. as far as bones go. And the minimum circumference of the bone is 64 centimeters, which doesn't sound like the circumference of a bone so much as like the circumference of a thigh <laughs> like <laughs> with all the meat and everything on top of it. So, yeah, very not brachiosaurus. Yeah, very large dinosaur, that brachiosaurus. Overall, the right one is in pretty good shape, at least. It is, however, not the longest brachiosaurus humerus that's been found. The Riggs Hill holotype is about 203 centimeters a couple centimeters longer and there are several other brachiosaurus specimens around the u.s they're housed around the u.s but they were found well they were also found around the u.s it was utah colorado wyoming yeah and the, i think they said that the range is pretty small in terms of the length of the humerus like they're all 200 centimeters plus or minus like five centimeters so like right around six and a half feet plus or minus a couple inches yeah One thing that I didn't realize is even though, you know, we found multiple Brachiosaurus specimens in all these different areas, they're pretty rare for the Morris information. They found 10 Brachiosaurus compared to 205 Camarasaurus, (laughs) 112 Diplodocus, 110 Apatosaurus, and then you get down to lower numbers is 13 Barosaurus and 11 Haplocanthosaurus. Yeah, that's crazy, though. There's more haplocanthosaurus than there are brachiosaurus, but everybody knows what brachiosaurus is. Yeah. Also, camarasaurus. That camarasaurus is the most common. Yeah. And most people don't know camarasaurus unless you're into dinosaurs. But everybody knows brachiosaurus and everybody knows apatosaurus. Maybe not everybody knows apatosaurus. A lot of people know brontosaurus. A lot but... of people know diplodocus, too. Yeah. Yeah, it's really interesting. I didn't realize how rare brachiosaurus was. And I definitely didn't realize how common <laughs> some of these other mm-hmm. sauropods were. That is, I think that was the minimum number of individuals I said. So it's not like, again, not the number of complete skeletons that we have. It's like we have about that many left femur or something, some bones that you can identify. It's at least that many individuals, and it's not just different pieces of the same skeleton. And this new specimen that they're talking about is the oldest known brachiosaurus. It's also the farthest west found brachiosaurus. Yeah, pretty cool. They don't know exactly how old, though. They were talking about how it's really hard to date and it's really hard to compare because, like you said, like one's from Wyoming, one's from Colorado, one's from southern Utah. Right. And there's only 10 of them. Yeah. There are a couple of good questions in the Q&A session. Somebody asked how Brachiosaurus compares in size to Giraffe Titan. And they said that Giraffe Titan is a little bit bigger. In terms of how old this Brachiosaurus was versus some of the other, their best guess at sort of the range of Brachiosaurus timeline, how long it was alive, was about 7 million years. <laughs> Essentially, the entire range of the Morrison formation in terms of dates. 7 million years is a really long time for a single genus, especially species, to be around for. So that's pretty cool. Yeah. And it's really weird that they were around for such a broad time period and we find so few of them. So it it makes you wonder, were they really uncommon or were they like mountain specialists? Right. <laughs> so that's why they had such long necks and the upright posture. They were going for like high up things that in the would, mountains. That would know. be cool if Brachiosaurus turned out to be a mountain dinosaur. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> There's something going on why we don't find as many of them. Something's different about it for sure. It could also just be that there's some seasonal difference where the other ones happen to be in the floodplains when it floods and Brachiosaurus is off somewhere else, too. They're better survivalists. <laughs> yeah, I guess so. Up next, we've got a talk from Omar Regalado, and they were looking at Platiosaurus, specifically the Platiosaurus neotype and some other little bones that were found unlabeled, sorting out where they belong. So Platiosaurus has a lot of species. As Omar put it, quote, 
the assumption that every large dinosaur from Central Europe belonged to Platyosaurus may have added extra noise. <laughs> <laughs> One of those wastebasket taxons. Pretty much, yeah. So Platyosaurus, we've talked a lot about Platyosaurus, and it is an amazing dinosaur in that we have a lot of specimens of it. We have over 100 specimens of Platyosaurus, and we have over 100 just from southwest Germany alone, in <laughs> fact. So it's pretty amazing. It was one of the dinosaurs that really shaped our understanding of dinosauria, right? It was like one of the first dinosaurs to be named, certainly one of the first sauropodomorphs. Oh, yeah. Described in 1837. We covered that as our dinosaur of the day in episode 152. Yeah, despite it being one of the first dinosaurs named, it was not one of the first dinosaurs we covered. <laughs> but part of that is because it is confusing. There are so many different species. And in 2016, they found a pelvis that wasn't labeled in a collection. And after digitally scanning and analyzing the specimen, they determined that it belongs to specimen number GPIT4. And they also found a Friedrich von Huhn description that may have described this bone, which is pretty cool. So might have figured out where this mystery pelvis goes. I like it when dinosaur mysteries are solved. Yeah. When they included this specimen number GPIT4 into a data matrix, they found that it came out in a large group that includes Musaurus. So it's just like a polytomy. It was all messy. And it showed that there were likely early sauropodomorphs coexisting with more derived sauropodomorphs in Germany, just like they were in England. So we're getting, again, that late Triassic, early Jurassic, high diversity of all sorts of different <laughs> evolution happening was going on in southwest Germany, just like it was in other parts of the world. So it's pretty interesting. And it also might point to maybe not calling all of these things Palladiosaurus in the future. Makes sense. They've already been reduced down quite a bit, but we'll see how it goes in the future. Up next, we've got a talk from Daniel Dunphy, and they were looking at Dryosaurus, specifically a baby Dryosaurus and its brain case. And a subadult and an adult. Yeah, but the baby is the, is the real moneymaker. <laughs> I guess so. <laughs> so, <laughs> Dryosaurus is a small iguanodontian, it's described as, but it really looks like a lot of other really small bipedal dinosaurs. The juvenile in question, also known as a baby, is CM11340, but yeah, there is a subadult and an adult included in their analysis too. All of them were found in Dinosaur National Monument in the brushy basin member of the Morrison Formation, not the saltwash member. This is higher up a little bit later. The juvenile one has one of the best brain cases for a non-hadrosaurid or nithopod. A lot of times we just say hadrosaurs as like a shorthand. We should probably say ornithopods because that includes a slightly larger group, but Nobody knows what ornithopods are. Everybody knows hadrosaurs, so we usually say hadrosaurs. They CT scanned all of them to compare them, and they were especially interested in the baby skull because, again, we don't have a lot of baby skulls of ornithopods, especially with preserved brain cases. What they found is that overall, the baby skull is relatively complete. You can't necessarily tell because it always has a little bit of matrix and you never know what it's going to look like when you CT scan it. But they got lucky and most of the bones are in there, although unfortunately most of them are also incomplete and disarticulated. <laughs> so they needed to do a lot of work digitally to both reassemble it and then also to try to reconstruct the bones. So to reconstruct them, what they did was, we talked about this a couple times at SVP, they used mirror images of some of the bones that were better preserved over to the side of the skull where you only had a little piece of a bone or maybe no bone at all. And they ended up finding all sorts of new details of the brain case, although, you know, it's all just like shapes and sizes and things. There isn't a lot of analysis about how that changed the way the dinosaur acted, so I'm not going to go into all of it, but... One interesting thing is they also found that there were 15 bones in the sclerotic ring. That's that thing that dinosaurs and a lot of other lizards and things have where it's sort of like where our iris is on our eye. They actually have bony plates there. Mm -hmm. It's really cool looking. That's a lot of bones for that 
small area. Yeah, and it, it shows you how like it's pretty rare to get them fossilized because they're so tiny and fragile and they, you know, once the eye decomposes, they're just free to flow around. They're not anchored to anything around them with tendons or anything stronger. So we don't usually find them except in cases like this where the whole head gets buried and then we don't prep it out and you can see it in a CT scan. Yeah, and all these fossils were found from the Carnegie Quarry of Dinosaur National Monument. Oh, nice. I didn't realize they were in the Carnegie Quarry. That's cool. They also found that one of the differences of how the skull changes as it ages is that the adults had eight more tooth positions than the younger specimen, which is just like us. We have about 20 baby teeth and 28 teeth when we're adults. Although if you have your full set of wisdom teeth, you actually have 32 teeth. So maybe we have more than dryosaurus <laughs> did. <laughs> I always like it when we have things in common with dinosaurs. Mm-hmm. And last for the dinosaur systematics session was a really interesting talk by Larry Bradley that was focusing on how dinosaur resources and paleontological resources in general have been what he called dispossessed from Native American lands, which I think is a charitable way of saying stolen. Mm. (laughs) Because basically a lot of the beginning of the talk was establishing how the U.S. government And Native American tribes had come up with all sorts of agreements about who owns what land and who has the rights to do what on what land. And at the same time, the federal government was paying fossil collectors to go in and take property from that land without getting any permission or anything of the sort. So specifically, they were looking at Sioux lands. He first noticed the problem when he found out that a plesiosaur was being collected from the Santee Sioux Reservation land in 2003. And he asked basically the people that should give permission for things being taken from the land if they gave permission. And they were like, no, we we didn't give any permission for this. And so it just sort of started a discussion with the tribe. Then he wanted to know how far back this went. So he started looking at field notes, diaries, letters, museum collections, websites, photographs, and maps. Yeah, there's a, there's a lot to go through, including just figuring out where the Sioux territory was at different times because the federal government kept basically pushing them into smaller and smaller and farther west and farther west pieces of land. But in terms of dinosaurs, they more or less got forced over towards the Badlands, mm-hmm. which is where Hell Creek is. <laughs> I think he described it as a fossil rush of the Badlands. Yes, and a lot of that was Sioux territory. So that included most of South Dakota, a lot of North Dakota, parts of eastern Montana and Wyoming. Earlier on, it had southern Minnesota and northern Nebraska as well. But especially when we're talking about Montana, Wyoming, the Dakotas, it included, for example, all of the Black Hills, Mm -hmm. (laughs) which is where a lot of T-Rex specimens are from. Yeah. And he talked a little bit about Bone Wars times, like O.C. Marsh and his students and how they came with the U.S. Cavalry and they had Pawnee scouts as escorts and a lot of arms with them. And he mentioned how sometimes tribes were pitted against each other, like Pawnee versus Lakota. And like the Lakota probably didn't give Yale, the university, permission to look for fossils. Uh, But Yale students then took Lakota skulls. They were directed by Marsh. Yeah, so part of the key to that is that the Pawnee and the Sioux did not get along at all. So if they were going into Sioux territory and bringing Pawnee with them, it's basically like they took a military from another government into their land in order to, well, they did. I mean, they had the U.S. military, but they were also bringing in military from other Native American nations. So it was very clearly not done in a let's all get permission and do this the right way. It was uh, I'm going to go in with force and take what I want to take. And we knew that you talked about that during the Bone Wars discussion that they often had military escorts during these things. And we always thought about it like, yeah, it's the Wild West. You need your escorts. But we didn't think about why. Mm-hmm. Like, what are, you, what are you afraid of? It's like, oh, because you're stealing stuff. That's why you need them. And they're trying to figure out basically where to go forward with it, which is pretty interesting because there are already different schools and different collections that are making progress on changing the way that they collect fossils as well as trying to repatriate fossils, basically. So Bradley says that personally, he thinks that fossils should probably be returned to the tribes, but it should be up to the tribes to decide, which is 
you know, basically what we talk about with every country when fossils are taken away illegally, you need to return them. But not everybody is interested in getting every single fossil back. It just depends on the on the country where they're coming from. At a minimum, when they're on display, say, in a museum, and it says what state they're from, they should have information about what reservation they came from, for example. And on top of that, some of the material from the South Dakota School of Mines is being transferred to the Oglala Lakota College, which started a paleontology program a few years ago. So they're already doing some of this. And they did go through their collections and try to figure out where these different fossils came from and basically found that, yeah, pretty much all of them came (laughs) from Lakota land. So they're considering them Lakota fossils that are just housed at the School of Mines for now. And then maybe over time, more of them will be moved. But it's cool because it's getting more people interested in paleontology. And it's an element of where fossils came from and repatriating fossils that we've never heard about before. Yeah. I don't think anybody really thought about it until this guy saw that plesiosaur a little less than 20 years ago and thought, like, wait a second. (laughs) That's weird. Or people might have been thinking about it, but this is the first time we've heard about it. Yeah. So now moving on to the Colbert Poster Prize sessions. The first poster that we'll share is by Nohong Kim, who had a poster about the relationship between the thickness of an eggshell and their microstructure and how that might have affected how dinosaurs and birds and non-avian dinosaurs hatched. So different microstructure made it easier to hatch? Not so much that it made it easier or harder, but it's more that the microstructure in non-avian dinosaur eggs made them more fragile which means that they had to have thicker-shelled eggs than you see in birds today. So they started by saying there's a lot of differences in dinosaur eggs. Thick-shelled eggs, which is defined as over 4 millimeters. Oh, yeah, that's a very thick egg. (laughs) Yeah, they're in three clades. There's ornithopods, sauropods, avian theropods. So how did these eggs hatch? Because they're so thick. And they analyzed avian and non-avian eggs, and they found in ornithopod, sauropod, and paleonate eggs, the eggshell crystal structure had this low misorientation angle, and that gives them this fragile structure, which may be necessary for hatching thick-shelled eggs. Hmm. Interesting. So as they get bigger, they get thicker, and then when they get thicker, they need to become relatively more fragile so that they can be hatched. Yeah. (laughs) This is weird. And they talked about how bird eggs, neonate eggs, may have evolved these higher angles in the crystal structure that are stronger than dinosaur eggs. And that might have enabled them to have thinner eggshells with less calcite. Nice. That does seem like an advantage. And they're saying it's really interesting from an incubation point of view. You got the non-theropod eggs. They don't need to be as thick because they're buried in substrates, but they are thick. And then the avian eggs that you'd think would be thicker to support contact incubation, the birds sitting on them, is the opposite. (laughs) Because there's a lot more going on than just how much weight is on the egg. There's this how big they are changes how thick they are, and that changes the structure and also a bunch of random evolution. There's a lot to consider when it comes to eggs. The next poster was by Case Vincent Miller about the diet of fossil birds And then they came up with a new framework for evaluating the diets of fossil birds. So it starts off, you know, extant birds, they're key players in today's ecosystems. There's a lot of diversity in their diets. But the diets of non-crown birds and their roles in Mesozoic ecosystems, we mostly don't know. Because fossilized meals, also known as consumolites, are too rare to give a detailed picture of the diet by themselves. Consumolites. Yeah, that was a fun word. (laughs) I haven't heard that. We always just talk about fossilized gut contents. We're going to have to start calling it consumalites. I think it's because it doesn't have to necessarily be in the gut. It could be in the mouth or in the throat. Oh, that's true. So they looked at diets of living and non-avian theropods to figure out a fossil bird diet and then made this framework looking at what they said were seven dietary proxies. So one is dental microware. For example, if you have highly pitted teeth, you probably ate hard foods like nuts, seeds, large invertebrates, 
possibly bones. If it was highly scratched, you probably ate rough, abrasive foods like leaves, other plant parts, vertebrates, and no scratches or pits on the teeth probably meant that they ate soft, non-abrasive foods like nectar, some fruits, smaller, soft-bodied invertebrates. Then they looked at the muscular reconstruction of cervical vertebrae and stable isotopes in the teeth. They said a high trophic level could be vertebrates or carrion, and a low trophic level may mean that they ate plants or herbivorous invertebrates. They also looked at the body mass, so if it was carnivorous and larger, it was probably likely to hunt or scavenge, and if it was carnivorous and smaller, it probably hunted invertebrates. And they looked at the morphometrics in the teeth. They said the relevant results were a bit unclear. And phalanges, if they had highly recurved, you know, if they had talons, then they probably hunted vertebrates or large invertebrates. Then they looked at the lever modeling of the skull, and that helps to show whether the animal was adapted for resilient, slow-moving food sources like plants or immobile invertebrates, or if it was adapted for vulnerable, fast-moving prey like mobile invertebrates and vertebrates. They also looked at the finite element analysis, FEA, of the skull, and that helps show whether the animal would be adapted for resistant food sources like seeds or nuts, large invertebrates or large vertebrates, or for what they call compliant food sources like nectar, fruit, small invertebrates, and small vertebrates. So they looked at all the taxon, and then they assigned a specific kind of diet to it. If the specimen was found with some fossilized meals, the consumolites, and or if Two of these dietary proxies were in agreement, like the wear patterns on teeth, whether or not it had talons, then it's probably going after this larger prey, that kind of thing. And they ended up assigning a new diet to Confucius Ornus as an herbivore. Huh. Yeah. That's interesting. That was surprising to me, too. And Shunchi Ornus as a vertivore, which means it eats mostly vertebrates. Learned a few new words from that poster. Cool. Yeah, you definitely can't tell just by looking at the size of the animal necessarily Mm -hmm. what it ate, how large its prey was, because there are all sorts of modern examples of really big things that are herbivores or small things that are herbivores, and same thing with predators. Even old examples like Dinochirus. Yeah, exactly. Sometimes it's deceiving, so it's good that they wanted at least two things in agreement. It'd be nice if they had more than two, like three or four things that all point to the same sort of behavior, but... Probably a starting point because it's a whole new framework. Yeah, and I, I'm guessing it's because of the incompleteness of fossils. Mm-hmm. You often don't have the teeth and the hands and the gut and the feet and yeah. <laughs> everything else. And the last poster that we'll share from the Colbert session is by Damiana Landy. And it, they were looking at the cranial endocast of Brea Gyps clarki. It's this extinct basal most condor from the late Pleistocene. And it's from La Brea. Wow, that's cool. The well, the earliest condor, basically, that we know of? Yeah. Yeah, so they have characters that they expected to find in a bird, but its olfactory bulbs were much lower than expected for being a scavenger. That's yeah, like we were talking about recently. Mm-hmm. That not all scavengers could smell so well. Yeah. And especially when you compare it to other taxa, like the Andean condor, which had very large olfactory bulbs when compared to the endocast. Hmm. But Brea Gyps had one of the smallest ones. So it's possible that sense of smell was a relatively new feature and that basal condors just weren't as efficient or acute. And it could be that scavenging is relatively recent for condors and they had shifted to scavenging from a more predatory diet. Yeah, or they were managing to scavenge without the sense of smell too. Yeah, that too. That's really interesting. I didn't realize that condors were that recent of a evolutionary lineage in the Pleistocene. It's yeah. pretty recent. I was thinking birds know how to diversify. <laughs> that's that's for sure. All 10,000 plus species of them. Mm-hmm. All right, next up, we've got some non-SVP related news. And the first one is about the new dinosaur, Brystonia simmonsi which was found on the Isle of Wight. It's from the Lower Cretaceous Wessex Formation. And this was published by Jeremy Lockwood and others in the Journal of Systematic Paleontology. It's been a while since you covered a peer-reviewed journal article of a new dinosaur. I guess I fell keyword off the ball. <laughs> oh, I was thinking keyword new dinosaur, because I'm reading these every week for the dinosaur of the day. 
Oh, true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, there's a lot of new dinosaurs, so I want to make sure we're keeping up. <laughs> <laughs> I just figured I'd get to them when we were done with SVP. <laughs> <laughs> there's still plenty for you to do. Don't worry. Okay, good. <laughs> So, Brystonius was a non-hadrosaurid hadrosauriform. That's an ornithopod, in mm-hmm. other words. <laughs> and it increases the number of known hadrosauriform diversity in England, because mostly it was iguanodon and mantellosaurus before. Mm. Oh, yeah. So, if it's a hadrosauriform, then it's a little more specific than just an ornithopod. Mm-hmm. It's like closer to hadrosaurus than iguanodon. In the paper, it said it was the first, quote, well-characterized novel hadrosauriform taxon from the Isle of Wight in the 100 years since Hooley obtained the skeleton of Mantellosaurus atherfieldensis in 1914. Wow. Quote. Yeah. yeah. They've been finding lots of really great stuff on the Isle of Wight. Yeah. Well, so this holotype was actually found in 1978 along <laughs> with Neovenador. And it was thought to be an iguanodon and then later referred to Mantellosaurus. <laughs> to get both there. They knew it wasn't a hadrosaur, but they didn't know where it was within the ornithopod group. <laughs> now, the holotype is a partial skeleton that includes the right premaxilla, maxillae, jugal bones, predentary, dentaries, vertebrae, sacrum, ribs, right thigh bone, and more. Some of those fossils, including two dorsal vertebrae, are privately owned, and so those weren't described in the paper. Boo hiss. At least they were able to describe these other fossils. Yeah, and they know they exist, so maybe they'll end up in a collection eventually, hopefully. And they know that it was different enough from Mantellosaurus to be its own genus. So it had a bulbous nose. Kind of like that, similar to Tarkia ankylosaur. Yeah. The bulbous scute on its nose. Exactly. It also had an elongated and low bump on the snout. And it had more teeth. There's 28 compared to 23 or 24 on Mantellosaurus. And a long, thin dentary that is lower and longer than Mantellosaurus. Also, Mantellosaurus is about 4 million years younger. Mm, yeah. So unless it's like Brachiosaurus and really lasts in a long time. Mm-hmm. These fossils, they said they were gradually exposed. They found a lot of isolated and fragmentary material, and it was collected by many different individuals. That happens a lot at the Isle of Wight. Yeah. And Gideon Mantell wrote a guidebook about the Isle of Wight and mentioned some of these issues of iguanodon found there. He wrote, quote, The quantity of bones collected from the seashore is very considerable and must have belonged to between 150 to 200 individuals, though from their abraded and mutilated condition, but few of the specimens were instructive, end quote. Yeah, at least back then. Mm -hmm. Nowadays, we've got all sorts of fancy new technology and a better sample set to work from. Sometimes you can get scientific information from even not the best specimens. Yeah, definitely. And then they're nice to have. Then you have them. (laughs) Brystonius is estimated to be about 26 feet or 8 meters long and weighed almost 2,000 pounds or 900 kilograms and lived in the early Cretaceous. The genus name refers to Brystone, the village that was close to the excavation site and also home of Victorian fossil collector Reverend William Fox. That name comes up from time to time. The species name, Simmonsi, is in honor of Keith Simmons, who found the specimen. The paper mentioned that after Brystonius, specimens found in the Wielden group shouldn't be referred to Mantellosaurus or Iguanodon unless they have specific atapomorphies. Oh, that makes sense. Because sometimes if you say like, oh, we only have this one genus from this family in this area, then people will find fossils and be like, oh, yeah, it must be from that one. Mm -hmm. But if there are multiple things that it could be from. Now there's a third one. Yeah. (laughs) In addition to, what were they? Mantellosaurus. And and Iguanodon. Iguanodon. We've got. Brystonius. Yeah. So, yeah, I guess don't be too quick to judge. (laughs) Mm -hmm. They're currently doing a detailed review of fossils from the Isle of Wight which that should be very informative. And they also mentioned that together with recent discoveries in Spain and the discovery of Brystonius, that quote suggests that their diversity in the upper wilden of Europe was considerably wider than initially realized. So maybe there'll be a fourth one or more. Yeah. Yeah, We've had several Isle of Wight dinosaurs named recently. Mm -hmm. Or at least important finds described, not necessarily all new genus. Yeah, described recently, because sometimes things were found in the 70s. Yeah. (laughs) Also got a quick update on the Marianning Rocks campaign. So uh, 
similar area. Just across the bridge? Boat? Trip? I think you have to take a boat. I don't mm. think there's a bridge. <laughs> <laughs> so a planning application for the Mary Anning statue has been submitted, and we've talked about it before. The statue is going to show Mary and her dog, and they're hoping the statue will be unveiled on what would be Mary's 223rd birthday. <laughs> Of course, the 223rd. <laughs> Everyone's favorite. Well, I think it's just you time it for a birthday and figure yeah, out which one. Exactly. Over in the U.S., the Perot Museum of Nature and Science in Dallas, Texas, has a reconstructed Alamosaurus. Nice. Yeah. There's plenty of bones to work from since everything seems to get assigned to Alamosaurus. Plus, it's giant. It's estimated to be 100 feet and weigh 50 tons. Alamosaurus lived about 67 million years ago. The first fossils were found in New Mexico in 1921, and then more fossils were found in Texas. And the Alamosaurus at the Perot Museum is actually composed of three individuals so that they could get all of the bones in place. Or at least many yeah. of the bones. They said the head and the first three vertebrae have never been found, so that part's an educated guess. Mm, that's a bummer. That's kind of an important part. Yeah. That's cool that it's actually based on specific individuals, though. When you first said that they had a reconstructed Alamosaurus, I was just imagining something that was entirely just guesswork mm -hmm. <laughs> from the few fossils that are around. But yeah, they know most of it. That's cool. And last in the news, the Royal Ontario Museum in Toronto in Ontario, Canada, opened a new gallery, the Wilner Madge Gallery, Dawn of Life. It's 10,000 square feet. It covers 4 billion years of evolution. So, of course, including dinosaurs. That's a lot of years per square foot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it took them two years to build it. It features almost 1,000 fossils. The earliest ones, they said, are from 4.2 to 3.7 billion years old. That's very old. Mm -hmm. I think there are some, like, shale deposits in northern Canada that have some of the oldest fossils in the world. So that might be... Part of the impetus for that. It's pretty cool. If you go there, you can also see artwork and animation. And then they have an interactive game where I guess people look for important fossils from Ontario. Nice. Yeah, the ROM is a really cool museum. Mm -hmm. I also want to go to the Perot Museum. I want to go to all the museums. <laughs> I really do want to go to all the museums. <laughs> Including going back to some museums. Like we were just talking about, we want to go back to the Smithsonian because we haven't seen it since they got updated. Yep. Yeah, we got a long list of places to see. And now onto our dinosaur of the day, Ankysaurus, which was a request from Paleo Mike 716 via our Patreon and Discord. So thanks. It was a basal sauropodomorph that lived in the early Jurassic in what is now Connecticut and Massachusetts in the U.S. in the Portland Formation. Now, until recently, it was considered to be a prosauropod. It looked like a typical sauropodomorph. It walked on two legs and it had a long neck and tail. It was bipedal, but it could walk on all fours. It was estimated to be 6.6 .6 feet or 2 meters long and weighed around 60 pounds or 27 kilograms. Although one of the species, it used to be considered a species, it used to be, Marsh named it Ankysaurus Major, but now that's actually considered to be Ankysaurus polyzealous, which is the type species. We'll get into that in a little bit. That one was estimated to be between 8 to 13 feet or 2.5 to 4 meters long and weighed up to 70 pounds or 32 kilograms. Oh, 10 pounds heavier. Mm -hmm. It's like going from medium small to medium medium. Medium medium dog <laughs> weight. <laughs> and then Gregory Paul estimated Ankysaurus to be 7.2 feet or 2.2 meters long and weigh 44 pounds or 20 kilograms. So he got quite a range there. Ankysaurus lived in an arid environment with wet and dry seasons. It had blunt teeth. It probably ate plants. But it also had a large thumb claw, possibly for defense or maybe grabbing tree branches. And maybe it was an omnivore. It was, for a while, thought to be a carnivore because of its claws. According to Richard Swan Lowell in the 1950s, he thought that Ankysaurus was, quote, an alert, active dinosaur preying upon the smaller vertebrates of his generation, as the powerful claws and well-developed teeth imply, end quote. Interesting. Mm -hmm. As we know, there are many herbivores with very large, impressive claws that do not eat meat. <laughs> That's true. Although, pretty good to talk about alert, active dinosaurs in the 1950s. Yeah. And I guess in the 1950s, we also hadn't found Therizinosaurus or Dinochirus yet. Mm -hmm. Ankysaurus had hands that were proportionally short to its arms. Now, the fossils were found very early. 
So, of course, it's got a long history with its names. <laughs> In 1973, Peter Galton wrote about the prosauropods of North America and the history of Anchisaurus. Talked about how the first fossils were found in 1818, quote, during blasting operations for a well in East Windsor, Connecticut. At first, these fossils were thought to be human bones oh, in 1820. You don't hear that often. Yeah. This is back in the day. And then in 1821, tail bones were reported. So they knew they weren't <laughs> human. Yeah, that would be unusual. In 1855, Wyman said that they were reptilian, and then Lull in 1912 referred the fossils to Ankysaurus colorus. And again, I'll get to all of those names in a little bit. The first fossils found in the Connecticut Valley were fragmentary and poorly preserved, and now thought to be indeterminate, though some of its features suggest that it's not the same species as the ones from Manchester that were found in 1884. So they're not just from Connecticut, they're also from Massachusetts. Yep. Yeah, in 1855, Edward Hitchcock, an ecologist, reported fossils found in Springfield, Massachusetts, that were found during, quote, blasting operations at the water shops of the United States Armory. <laughs> Wait, were we already talking about blasting operations? <laughs> yeah, there are blasting operations in Connecticut and Massachusetts. <laughs> it used to just blow everything up, I guess. <laughs> So Wyman described the fossils in 1858, but he didn't name them at the time. And those fossils are now at Amherst College Museum of Natural History. As you can imagine, there was a blast, so the fossils were damaged. And some of the bones may have been accidentally thrown away by workmen, or it's possible some people took them home, so the fossils are incomplete. In 1863, Hitchcock's son, Edward Hitchcock Jr., described the fossils in a supplement to his father's work on fossil footprints. And Hitchcock Jr. contacted Richard Owen, who told him to name a new genus based on the fossils. Owen suggested the name Megadactylus, which means large finger because it had a large thumb. <laughs> That's a fun name. Yeah. So it was Megadactylus polyzelis, and Hitchcock Jr. gave it the species name polyzelis. It means much sought for in Greek, and it refers to his father trying to figure out for years what animal made the tracks in his work. Mm. In 1889, Marsh described part of a skeleton found near Springfield, Massachusetts, that Hitchhawk had described in 1865 as Megadactylus, and he wrote, quote, It is a typical member of the order Theropoda and is apparently for its nearest allies in the old world, Thecodontosaurus, from the Trias of England, and Massospondylus from the same formation in South Africa, end quote. Cope described the specimen more in 1870, and then Marsh renamed it to Amphisaurus, which means near Saurian, in 1882, and then renamed it again to Ankysaurus, which means near lizard, in 1885. And that's because both of those other names, Megadactylus and Amphisaurus, were both, quote-unquote, preoccupied. Mm. Nothing quite like renaming your own thing a few years later. Yeah, why not? <laughs> <laughs> so then more fossils were found in Manchester, Connecticut. In 1884, while bridges were being built, amateur paleontologist Charles Owen saw a block with part of a skeleton in it, and he told Marsh, who acquired the block from Charles Wolcott, who owned the quarry at the time, and that block had the back half of a specimen. Marsh tried to get the front half, but the block with the front half was already part of a bridge. <laughs> So maybe someday that bridge will get demolished oh, and they it, can find it. It did. Oh. Well, first, really quick, Marsh named that specimen Ankysaurus Major in 1889, which means the larger one. In 1869, the bridge was demolished and John Ostrom got the block with the front half of the skeleton. Oh, that's awesome. It's probably the same one. It's hard to know for sure. But if you if you had the back half of a dinosaur and you knew the front half was included in a bridge and then you find a front half of a dinosaur in yep. the bridge. It's probably <laughs> the same dinosaur. Yeah. <laughs> and Ostrom had been looking for this block for two years and he learned that bridge builders had bought the block and used it in a local project. So he surveyed more than 60 bridges and figured out where the fossils were. Wow. And then when the bridge was scheduled to be demolished, he got permission for his team to examine it beforehand. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. That's amazing that they managed to find it. My guess was either that you were going to say it's still up because all our bridges in the U.S. are crazy old and falling apart, or that it got demolished, but it was like, well, there's no way they could possibly <laughs> find it. It's a whole bridge. How are you going to find the one block that might have a dinosaur if in you it? Have somebody determined enough. Yeah, spent, it has two years to spend on it. That's awesome. 
So we've got three well-preserved skeletons found near Manchester, Connecticut, as well as two fragmentary specimens. Marsh described the skeletons in multiple papers, and based on them named Amosaurus, which means sand saurian. Hadn't he already named it twice by now? Marsh names a lot of dinosaurs. <laughs> we know that that's one thing we learned from the Bone Wars. <laughs> so that was in 1891. Then Ankysaurus colorus, the mangled one, in 1891, and Ankysaurus solus in 1892. And Ankysaurus solus is a nearly complete specimen. In one of his papers, Marsh wrote, quote, one of the most slender and delicate dinosaurs yet discovered, being only surpassed in this respect by some of the smaller bird-like forms of the Jurassic, end quote. And Marsh also renamed Ankysaurus Major as Amosaurus in 1891. Yeah, I don't know why he kept renaming things. <laughs> <laughs> I came up with a better name. Now we're going to call it this. <laughs> So the specimens from Manchester are now thought to be the same as Ankysaurus polyzelus. They're housed at the Peabody Museum of Natural History. In 1906, Friedrich von Huhn said that Ankysaurus polyzelus resembled Ankysaurus colorus. Both had these elongate dorsal vertebrae, but still thought them to be different enough to be different species. Hewn also referred Ankysaurus polyzelus to Thecodontosaurus based on having a similar radius, tibia, and fibula. So Ankysaurus polyzelus for a while became Thecodontosaurus polyzelus. But in 1915, Lull disagreed, and he also said that if Hume were correct, all Ankysaurus would be a synonym for Thecodontosaurus, since Ankysaurus polyzelus is the type species. Hume corrected this in 1932 by referring Ankysaurus solus to Amosaurus and made Ankysaurus colorus the type species of Yalesaurus. Yalesaurus, interesting. Yep. And he referred Ankysaurus solus to Amosaurus because of the similarities in the ilium, tibia, and dorsal vertebrae. But Amosaurus was Ankysaurus. Oh, I guess those are different species. Yes. In 1953... Lull accepted Yellowsaurus as valid, but still recognized Ankysaurus polyzelus and Ankysaurus solus. So now we've got another one. Yes. Now the holotype of Ankysaurus polyzelus does not include skull material. In 1976, Peter Galton renamed Gryposaurus capensis bones that were found in South Africa and named in 1911 as Ankysaurus capensis. But now that's thought to be a juvenile massospondylus, Carinatus. Galton also recognized Ankysaurus polyzelus, the one found in Charles Wolcott's quarry in Connecticut, and Amosaurus major. Meaning he considered those valid? Yes, but then he referred the species Ankysaurus solus to Amosaurus major. He also found Ankysaurus colorus to be a junior synonym of Ankysaurus polyzelus and Yalesaurus to be a synonym for Ankysaurus. This is very confusing. Yes. <laughs> And then in 2008, Gauthier and Gall found Amosaurus major to be a junior synonym of Ankysaurus polyzelus. Okay, so that means Ankysaurus major went away. Yes. And Amosaurus major, which were the same. Hmm. We're just kind of whittling it down at this point. Then, in 2010, Adam Yates wrote a revision of the problematic sauropodomorph dinosaurs from Manchester, Connecticut, and the status of Ankysaurus marsh, and found that Ankysaurus polyzelus is the only valid one. And other paleontologists had agreed with this earlier. Okay, now we're simple again. Yes. So <laughs> Ankysaurus, which was named, was like the second name it had or so by Marsh <laughs> a really long time ago. Ended up being the one that stuck. Yes. Ankysaurus polyzelus specifically. So Yalosaurus is now nomen dubium, it sounds like. Yep, it's Ankysaurus. That's kind of a bummer. I could see if you're at Yale thinking that's... It'd be nice to have a dinosaur named Yalosaurus, but yeah. it never will be because it got a sign. Somebody was too trigger happy on naming something Yalosaurus. <laughs> <laughs> now it got synonymized. So Yates found that all the Wolcott quarry specimens were the same species and found that they could all be referred to Ankysaurus polyzelus. Now the Wolcott quarry has since been filled in. Oh, that's a bummer. Yeah, but the specimens are now at the Peabody Museum. In 2007, Serino said Ankysaurus was a nomodubian, but Yates didn't agree. 
Serino said that there weren't enough diagnostic characters, quote, beyond those of basal sauropodomorpha, and quote, found in the fragmentary holotype. But Yates said that Ankysaurus had seven distinguishing characters relating to the skull, vertebral column, and pelvis, including a slender sacral rib and unusual proportions of the posterior dorsal centra. Yates also supported Ankysaurus being a basal sauropodomorph. So, just to recap, the type and only species considered valid today is Ankysaurus polyzealous. The genus name Ankysaurus means near lizard. Ankysaurus was a replacement name for Amphisaurus, which was a replacement name for Megadactylus, because they were already the names of other animals. Oh, I see. Okay, that's why they renamed it, why he renamed his own thing. Yes, they're was... preoccupied. Gotcha. Okay. So this is like the oldest one that wasn't preoccupied is the one that stuck. Exactly. Amosaurus, Ankysaurus solus, Ankysaurus colurus, also known as Yalosaurus, are now considered to be synonyms of Ankysaurus polyzealous. All three dinosaur skeletons were from the same early Jurassic Age Wolcott Quarry in Connecticut, but... Marsh named them all different species. He named them Ankysaurus Major, 1889, Ankysaurus Colorus in 1891, and Ankysaurus Solus in 1892. And then half a dozen other people renamed him as well. There was just all kinds of naming <laughs> things going on. But Polyzealous was an existing species name from way back when it was Megadactylus. Yes. So that's why the species name is Polyzealous, even though Ankysaurus as a name came up later. Yes. Now, it is hard to tell that Ankysaurus polyzealous and the Wolcott quarry skeletons were the same dinosaur because they didn't have too many overlapping parts of the skeleton to compare. But Yates found similarities in the hip blade and part of the fused vertebrae, which show that they were all related. So then, like you said, Garrett, Ankysaurus was named first, well, Ankysaurus polyzealous, so the name sticks. In 2015, the type specimen of Ankysaurus colorus became the neotype of Ankysaurus and then formally became the species Ankysaurus polyzealous. There's also tracks that seem to match with Ankysaurus's feet that have been found in Nova Scotia, but it's really hard to know for sure. And our fun fact. I'm doing new dinosaurs and the fun fact today. You're really stepping on my toes here. <laughs> <laughs> or picking up the slack. Sorry, not sorry. Yeah. <laughs> So it's really cool. NASA recently took a photo of the Chicxulub crater from space. That is cool. And you can see in front of the Yucatan coast an arc of 250 kilometers of sinkholes that show the edges of the crater. These sinkholes are known as cenotes, and they provided fresh water to the ancient Mayans. Oh, it's probably cenotes. I feel like they mention that on Legends of the Hidden Temple sometimes. Oh, that sounds right. Okay, <laughs> cenotes. They provided fresh water to the ancient Mayans. There's no other surface water because of the soluble limestone landscape. And they said that rainwater is slightly acidic, so surface water dissolves and goes through the limestone bedrock. And this creates the cenotes, caves, and the world's longest underground river. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. That's really cool. I remember we took a cruise, I think, with your family near the Yucatan Peninsula. And I was trying to see, because I was watching on Google Map when we were near <laughs> that spot. And I, I can't remember if we actually went over it, but I remember trying to spot it from a distance if there's any way <laughs> to see any indication. But of course you can't because it's way underwater and it's all buried. So Except you could see it from space. Yeah, it's weird. If you get farther away, you could see it. It's always getting that right angle on it. But that's super cool. It's really interesting that there's a connection you can draw between Mayans and the extinction of the dinosaurs. Mm-hmm. You can connect dinosaurs to anything. There were several ways that the dinosaurs being wiped out by the Chicxulub crater helped people. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Not only immediately in giving a chance for mammals to replace dinosaurs as like the, the dominant form on land, but also by giving drinking water to Mayans 66 million years later. <laughs> and that wraps up this episode of I Know Dino. <laughs> Thanks for listening. If you're not already in our community, then please consider joining. And if you'd like to do that, head over to patreon.com slash I know Dino. Thanks again. And until next time. <laughs>